listening to After Images, a podcast for cinephiles that takes a deep dive into moving images. Each episode features a special guest who is invited to explore a film of their choice. After Images is hosted by film writers Franck Bouleg and Marisa C. Hayes. Today's episode features a discussion with our guest, Robert Zinnerbrink, on the film Mulholland Drive. Written and directed by David Lynch, the film was released in 2001. Initially conceived as a television pilot, the director transformed the project into a feature-length film after it was rejected by television executives. Mulholland Drive follows the journey of an aspiring actress named Betty Elms in contemporary Los Angeles, where she meets a woman who has amnesia and calls herself Rita. Betty and Rita try to uncover the latter's true identity in a city of dreams ripe with Hollywood directors on the run, incompetent hitmen, and slow-talking cowboys. The film's trajectory through various levels of reality, multiple personalities, film references, and the Hollywoodian quest for stardom leaves the audience to actively participate in deciphering the film's meaning. Robert Zinnerbrink is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Macquarie University, Sydney. He is the author of New Philosophies of Film, An Introduction to Cinema as a Way of Thinking, Bloomsbury 2021. Terence Malick, Filmmaker and Philosopher, Bloomsbury 2019. Cinematic Ethics, Exploring Ethical Experience Through Film, Rutledge 2016. And New Philosophies of Film, Thinking Images, Continuum 2011. Today we're very happy to jump into the first episode of season two of After Images with our guest Robert Zinnerbrink. Thank you so much for being here today, Robert. Thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted. So we always like to begin with the question, why have you selected the film Mulholland Drive and what does it mean to you? Okay. Well, a very good question to uh, to start with. I think it's just such a marvellous, powerful film. It was certainly a film that had a huge impact on me when I saw it. And so we're talking 2001. Um, it was the year I submitted my PhD. It was the year I got married. Uh, it was a real watershed year. And it was probably also... Um, around that time that I was starting to feel very drawn to uh, taking film more seriously, just to give you a little bit of background. Um, you know, in my undergrad days, I actually started as a medical student of all things, and then found that that wasn't really for me. I had been terribly interested in philosophy, so I enrolled as an arts medicine student, started doing philosophy. I loved aesthetics, fell in love with aesthetics, I really didn't care much for logic or analytic metaphysics and so on. Um, but, you know, I was pretty focused as a philosophy student. But I was also terribly interested in film and, and creative writing and things like that. So for a while, I was a communication student, got very into film, uh, had been watching films as a student for, for, you know, a long time. And so, yeah, just this sort of convergence of events um, around that time. It was a film that really had an impact on me because I just found myself unable to stop thinking about it. Uh, or in addition to that, a film where images would recur, you know, at, at various points uh, during the day, you just find yourself recalling an image, a very powerful moment from the film. And so this, this combination of factors, be, being very interested in perhaps where am I going with my research after my PhD, I did a PhD in philosophy, continental philosophy, was becoming more interested in aesthetics, certainly in film. And here was this film that absolutely blew me away. I was just uh, transfixed. I, I, I was amazed and deeply perplexed and moved. And um, as I said, found myself thinking about the film constantly, recurring images coming back. Uh, so, you know, that was saying to me, this film has really affected you in, in uh, quite a deep and, and powerful way. So I guess out of that experience, starting to think about 
well, why? Why uh, am I experiencing the film? Or what does my experience mean? Uh, what is it about this film that uh, gives it this this power to to get deep into one's psyche, as it were? And uh, so for me, that that started, you know, just in the back of my mind, I suppose, uh, orienting me more and more towards thinking about film and and philosophy, which is what I was becoming more and more interested in. And yeah, it's an important film for me because it's probably the first film that I wrote about as a film in this kind of, you know, new phase of my research and career, which was starting to think about the film and philosophy relationship. So uh, my Holland Drive has a very special place in my heart and my uh, biography, I suppose, because that film, you know, in, in discussions with colleagues, you know, we... Um, uh, I was at Macquarie University already at that time. Uh, we had a little discussion group going, and we, I think we had some talks with some colleagues about the film. So it was the start of this trajectory that, you know, I guess I'm, I'm still uh, on, which is thinking about film and philosophy in a, in a, uh, a new way. And, yeah, so I, I do credit uh, Mulholland Drive for uh, a lot of those changes in, in, in my perspective and, and my experience and still find myself again drawn to the film thinking about about the film and of course having those images recurring uh, at various times and, and certainly after re-watching it recently again uh, I've, I've found the same experience happening it's happening again <laughs> <laughs> and, and what is it uh, you're saying that um, generates such an impact in the film that it leads you to uh, think uh, that that it, it it leads to philosophizing. What is it? Uh, is it a thought experiment? Uh, what what is uh, is it? The aesthetics of the film? Is it the story? Mm -hmm. What what part of the mixture uh, leads to the thinking? Yes. Look, in many ways, it's all of those elements. I suppose the the thing that to me is so striking about Lynch's work and this film in particular is just exemplary of, of Lynch's approach is the ability to combine conscious and unconscious elements and perspectives. Um, you know, it is a murder mystery at one level, um, you know, in the mode of a, of a noirish Hollywood drama at, at, at a certain level. Um, and, you know, you watch the film, and certainly the first third, two thirds, is very narrative driven, you know, and, and stunningly shot and, and almost otherworldly you know the use of color it's so saturated all those shots of um Naomi Watts as as Betty Betty Elms you know with this, this extraordinarily um beautifully lit face her hair the eyes of the sort of color schemes of her, her cardigans and the backdrop and so on so it's deeply rich and satisfying at a kind of sensuous level and at a narrative level the mystery is there sort of drawing you in but at the same time there are these darker you know um mesmerizing even traumatizing elements that are very hard to describe or name uh we're talking here about the use of sound um what people often describe as the sort of oniric or surreal kind of imagery and moments uh the sort of darker aspects of the story that that become more and more prominent as as you go through so it's that combination i think of of both conscious and unconscious elements. I mean, I wrote a piece about the film. I talked about uh, romanticism and, and the kind of uh, idea that the romantics, particularly the German romantics had, that art, uh, genuine art was in, in a sense, uh, capable of transcending philosophy because it provides a means of, of experiencing something like what the philosophers were trying to think and conceptualize then the being or the absolute or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we're able to do so through sensuous means, through imagination and and tapping into the unconscious. So we've got these wonderful uh, descriptions of art, you know, from philosophers like Schelling, uh, where you know art is the um, the ability of the artist is or their genius, if you like, is this capacity to combine conscious and unconscious thinking and expression mm -hmm. in in a, a meaningful whole. And mm -hmm. and that to me is what happens in Mulholland Drive. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it it goes some way to explaining this fascination that the film exerts it's a it's a mystery we're very drawn into the mystery and as you know there are myriad interpretations of the film sometimes quite conflicting ones 
And yet at the same time, it's this extraordinary aesthetic uh, experience that is very hard to describe and to name and to articulate and, and operates at deep affective, even unconscious levels, as well as in imaginative and, and more reflective levels. So I find those two dimensions being brought together mm. in the ways that they are through uh, Mulholland Holland Drive as a, as a whole, I, I find that really remarkable. Mm. Mm. I think that what you're saying really resonates with um, Umberto Eco's concept of the open work, that before he dove right. into semiotics, et cetera, he was really interested yeah. in this idea of plural readings and the way that the viewer or the reader can insert themselves into the work. And that also reminded me of your book, New Philosophies in Film, where you're speaking about film philosophy that can be an experience. And it sounds to me like that's echoing some of what you've just said about the, the romantics notion of, of what we can do to, to transcend, for example. And I'm wondering, having written your book, New Philosophies um, on of Film, excuse me, New Philosophies of Film is the title. I won't bumble that up anymore. Um, I'm wondering how your relationship to the film has changed. Has it caused you to think about the film in different ways after multiple viewings? Yes, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, for me, the, the most uh, uh, exciting, challenging and thought provoking films in that genuine sense of provoking thought. And I mean, um, not just analysis or interpretation or, you know, using the film to buttress a theoretical or philosophical perspective or, or, or a, a favoured theoretical model. I mean, thought as in trying to comprehend, understand, trying to orient oneself in the world through thinking. That's something that some artworks and certainly some films can achieve. And uh, for me, that happens when one experiences disorientation, um, when one's not uh, fully in control of or able to grasp the meaning of the experience that one's having. And so you are forced to think. You're thrown back upon thought as a way of trying to reorient yourself in the world. So that to me is what thought provoking in this sort of more emphatic sense means. And that's the kind of, you know, cinematic aesthetic experience one can have with a film like Mulholland Drive. So I don't think, you know, in a lot of the film and philosophy debates, um, you, you mentioned thought experiments, um, for example, uh, Mulholland Drive isn't a film that works that way. It's not presenting a particular kind of, you know, moral, ethical, political situation or some kind of dilemma that a character has to kind of work through, you know, like a, a moral choice type of dilemma or or even, you know, although it does touch on the sort of metaphysical questions of appearance, reality and so on, it's more about an experience. And you mentioned... Um, this, this notion of experience and, and a philosophical experience, well, aesthetic experience, which then I think can prompt or uh, invite some kind of philosophical response. And I think that's what's happening, at least for me, that's the kind of experience that, that I find really rich and, and, and quite transformative uh, with a film like uh, Mulholland Drive. So you, you can't quite get a grip on it. And I mean, even that experience of, um, and, and here's where you can think of those you know, classic aesthetic categories like the sublime. Uh, you, you, you can't quite provide a concept or a representation. Even your imagination is kind of pushed to its limits trying to, to comprehend and hold together the film. And we all know, you know, particularly those of us who've tried to write about films, and, and I'm thinking here of Frank's extraordinary uh, work on Twin Peaks, which is even not just a film, but a whole kind of uh, audiovisual universe, um, how difficult it is to hold so to speak, in one's mind, in one's imagination, um, even, you know, relatively short sequences of a film, because there is just so much happening, you know. It's, it's one of those things you do with your film students, you say, show you this one minute clip, you tell me what happens, and we'll see how many errors mm. creep in. And that's not to say you weren't paying attention, it's to say that you experience and recollect film in many ways, like like dreams, right, which will get us to my Holland Drive, right? Um, that is, you know, you chunk together things, you reverse or kind of edit, essentially, and give a, a version and interpretation. But these sorts of films, a film like Mulholland Drive, you, you, you don't have that mastery over the film. You don't have a la um, 
you know, Noel Carroll and David Bauble, the idea of a narrative that is modeled on, if you like, the practice of questions and answers. So, you know, the film, the movie poses questions, you know, um, who is uh, Rita? <laughs> um, what does the money and the key mean, right? Um, you know, um, who is really responsible for the suicide at, at the end of whoever that character uh, mm. turns out? You don't have those questions neatly resolved by the end of the film, right? That sort of classic idea of closure. And, you know, for some film goers, that's what makes a film like Mulholland Drive deeply troubling, mm. disturbing, upsetting. Uh, frustrating for others it's part of the extraordinary experience of a pleasurable disorientation or a pleasure, pleasurable cognitive kind of confusion um and, and affective disorientation that is part of the experience of of the film what makes it great so so you know people will vary in in their uh experiences of the film and, and then what they make of those experiences but certainly for me that sense of disorientation of not being able to orient yourself of not being able to fully grasp or comprehend the sublimity uh of of what you're experiencing uh through the film that's what prompts certain kind of thinking and i think to my mind that's what uh, uh allows one to say well it is philosophical in a certain sense even though it's not presenting any particular theory or or um you know philosophical kind of argument or perspective and this is very interesting because we were thinking uh, with Marisa ahead of this interview um, about psychogeography in relationship uh, to Twin Peaks. And when you're talking about disorientation, of course, there is really something about not having your bearings anymore in this, yeah. this map. Um, and uh, I was thinking about what you said about the hybrid nature of the film, the fact that mm. it combines elements, levels of consciousness that are usually kept distinct and... Um, yes loses you uh, in this in this realm uh, and I would say that it is a bit like what Lynch says when he calls when he says that there's room to dream he leaves you room yes. to dream, the audience um, so yeah um, I suppose my question is uh, is it the fact that the film loses us the audience along the way that um, enables it to be so strong uh, in a sense because it does leave you this room to to dream mm. to see to uh to hypothesize yes yes look i think i think that's a really fascinating way of talking about the film um both the idea that it, it leaves this room to dream and i i love that phrase that lynch uses and it's really interesting um because of course you know subsequent to mulholland drive when he starts making lots of um experimental um sort of short videos that he puts up on his website a lot of the material then uh you know the rabbits series and so on that uh, eventually gets worked up in um, inland empire so from 2006 where he's kind of made the shift to digital media and of course what's remarkable about lynch is he's one of these kind of artists this generation of filmmakers of new hollywood kind of um generation um just, just as an aside i was um, reading some uh, actually a wonderful um, book that's going to come out on Terence Malick and talks there about the, I think it was the inaugural class of 69 or whatever um, at the newly established film school in, in, in LA National Film School. And that this class of um, new recruits included, uh, in addition to Malick, um, David Lynch and Paul Schrader. I was thinking, wow, <laughs> that's one hell of a class <laughs> to have been in. Um, so this generation of filmmakers um, who really put a stamp on, certainly in, in American cinema and, and obviously more, more globally um, as a consequence, uh, and kind of you know, have been talked about in terms of New Hollywood and introducing, it's a small hybrid approach again, you know, think about the um, relationship to the European art tradition. Now, I, I think that's something that's deeply fascinating about Lynch. I mean, just at a production level, as, as you know, the story um you know people are probably familiar how it was uh, originally supposed to be a television um series right I mentioned twin peaks earlier so uh from mine saying that was the idea you know there was that our pilot that that lynch uh, made the, the abc and it was not back you know that 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 um apocryphal story about the um executive getting up at 6 a.m one morning with a cup of coffee trying to watch the first day of the oh, this is awful and it was canned right and um yeah, so it's not surprising that a lot of critics have read into 
the awful experiences uh, that, you know, Betty slash Diane has in Hollywood, and also the experiences of director Adam Kesher, this is no longer your film. Yeah, it's it's tempting not to read some kind of autobiographical dimension in, in, into uh, Mulholland Drive already. But um, yeah, I mean, there is that sort of transition out of uh, the sort of classic Hollywood or even the end of Hollywood phase, even the end of new Hollywood into something else. And to my mind, what's so fascinating, uh, among other things, uh, this, this space that the film gives you to, to really luxuriate in uh, cinema in that kind of old school sense. And of course, you know, if you watch the first, you know, hour of the film, uh, it, as I said, it's remarkably um, old school in its compositional style. The dialogue is strangely off as in hokey, corny, some, something out of the 1950s. Um, you know, uh, Betty, Betty Elms, even the name that, uh, you know, Naomi Watts so beautifully portrays. She said, I think, that she modelled the character, certainly in that first part, on a kind of um, mashing together of uh, Doris Day and um, Tippi Hedren. And, yeah, so this, this kind of classic old school kind of Hollywood um, actresses and, and stars. So that's all there. But it's also this kind of, not just a lament, but, but a, a critique. There's the dark side of, of Hollywood. Um, and that is much more... Um, you know, deeply explored and and even dramatically uncovered in Inland Empire, right? Which is in some ways a, a kind of a, a you know a follow on uh, from my whole drive. So there is that sort of meta cinematic level where you know we're, we're drawn into the mystery, you know, and and, and the characters and and the very confusing um, plot developments. But there's also something there about cinema, about American cinema. And its relationship to the European um, art cinema tradition. I mean, it's no surprise. As, as the story goes, you know, Pilot tanked, and it was, um, you know, Canal, a studio Canal that stepped in and, you know, basically allowed Lynch the um, resources to to finish the film and make it as a as a film. So you get this sort of hybrid production uh, in even in the making of um, *A Home Drive*. But I think at a, at another level. You know, it's pretty clear that the film is also um, probing this relationship between Hollywood and European, you know, the sort of grand tradition of European auteur cinema, right? So, you know, there's, there's obvious illusions. I'm taking Hollywood, there's not only a strong Hitchcock dimension there. I mean, I see a lot of vertigo in the film, even down to the sort of shot stylization and use of light. You know, the um, scene around this um, Sierra Bonita apartments mm -hmm. where um, Betty and Rita are about to uncover the trauma at the core of a reader's, you know, memory loss, not just the accident, but the real uh, trauma, um, is shot very much in the style of vertigo, um, even down to that sort of strangely misty filtered light. Um, I think um, Naomi Watts as Betty is sporting a, what I would think of as a um, Madeline suit, mm. a nice great set. So there's obvious allusions there to, to Hitchcock, but there's, you know, clearly a Bergman persona is referenced at least in, in two quite explicit sequences with the sort of half face on the bed, uh, but also the two shots of, um, you know, Betty and, and uh, Rita in the mirror where, where she's really just chopped off her hair and put on Dom's the uh, blonde wig. You know, there's, I think there's a resonance of uh, Godard and uh, Le Mépris in there as well. So, you know, there, there's lots of to and fro. Um, and and at, at, at that level, and here I, I think it comes back to this sort of question you asked about the you know philosophical dimension of the film. Um, in some ways, well, there's, there's a lot of dream and reality kind of um, ambiguity being explored in the film. We, we can talk about that because that's often the way I think the film is mostly uh, has been discussed in terms of this dream reality. You know, there's the first part, the dream slash fantasy of the. Uh, actual events that transpired involving uh, Diane, the Diane character, and uh, the dark-haired Camilla Rhodes, mm. uh, Lauren Elena Haring. Um, but there is another dream level which is much, I think, broader, which is which is cinema itself. And I think there's this fascinating, um, almost a recollection of uh, other films. You know, Sunset Boulevard, obviously, um, in there, as well as films from the um, European tradition. So, so this this whole you know, film within a film nesting kind of structure, the location, setting, 
you know, we, we not only go from Mul Mulholland Drive with the trauma, the accident, but other trauma, once it's revealed, happens right down to Sunset Boulevard. Um, you know, is, is, is very kind of clearly marked. So we're in a dream world, but we're also within a cinematic dream world mm -hmm. and within, within a cinematic universe. So this is where um, any attempt to sort of make sense of the film has to be able to sort of drift and move. And this is where we need space to dream, um, drift and move between those sort of more um, explicit, let's say, elements of the, the story, the mystery. Uh, but at the same time, recognize that we're in this sort of cinematic dream universe that that allows these strange cinematic dreams to happen. And um, in some ways, the whole film is such a cinematic dream in a sense. And this might be an interesting moment to bring in the notion of time. I'm thinking mm. about something you mentioned in your book, New Philosophies of Film, and the fact that time is this exploration, this area of philosophical thought that hasn't always been uh, applied or related to cinema and its myriad possibilities and understandings of time. And I think in this film, perhaps one of the things yeah. that can join these references to historic films that one may or may not recognize in the film to the very structure of the film itself and this disorientation that you've spoken of, I think regarding time, I'm just wondering mm. what you what you think about discussions of time in relationship to this film. And, and perhaps, yeah. oh. sorry, but perhaps to link this to the structure of the film itself, as you said, the first mm. part is very linear mm. in a sense, yeah. uh, very mm. cause and effect. Mm. Uh, 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 you could call it movement image uh, in the way it is built. Yes. Mm. The second one turns to more to the time image uh, of Deleuze yes. and, 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 and is a, a mirrors the first one in a, in a very deconstructed way. Yes, absolutely. No, I think that this question of time in the film is just deeply fascinating as well, because, um, I mean, one of the things the film is about, and I, I, I think of this uh, film also uh, in relation to, say, Blue Velvet, and then in that empire, um, I mean, these are films dealing with trauma as well. Um, and particularly around female characters, right? But as I mentioned, I think there's a another level of, you know, trauma is maybe too strong, but another level of, of tension and conflict, which is to do with cinema itself and what happens after cinema, cinema after cinema, the digital mm -hmm. transition. But it, this question of time and trauma involving repetition mm -hmm. and a kind of a, a, a constant revisiting that, that one can't fully grasp, so it requires a constant repetition. So there is that kind of dimension to the to the film, and one of the things that makes it so so challenging and, and disorienting um, to to watch is, as as you mentioned, Frank. I mean, the first um, you know let's call it the the, the Betty uh, story, the the Betty Rita um, part of the film, is very linear and quite classical in the way it's uh, presented in terms of narrative. Uh, continuity and structure. I mean, it's a mystery, you know, but we're being drawn further and further in. There are various clues, and you know, there's certainly a, a, a narrative momentum and a cause and effect kind of logic that's you know that's at play, like quite literally. Um, but one that's curious because it's all predicated again, as often happens with Lynch films, on messages or insights or intuitions uh, that are unconscious or let's say derived from the unconscious that one gains access to either through literally dreams or through aesthetic means, aesthetic experience. And what I mean is, um, I mean, an example, um, when Betty and Rita are, um, I think they're in the cafe and they see the waitress with the name Diane, the waitress who looks strangely like what we see you know, Naomi Watts as Diane uh, look like in the latter mm. third or whatever uh, of the film, The Diana Story. And the name Diana on the waitress's um, uniform triggers this memory. Diane, there's something there, uh, Rita says, I think I remember uh, the name is Diane Selwyn. And just, just prior to that, um, they've gone into the diner. It's Winky's, of course, Winky's Diner, right? And we'll talk about Winky's Diner in a second. Okay. Uh, She's made the telephone call to the police about the accident to confirm that there was such an accident. And the mention of Mulholland Drive, you know, 
is, is, is another kind of clue. So we get Mulholland Drive and we get Tyne Selwyn. So that's kind of, again, within that still fairly linear kind of narrative structure at that point. But even there, we're tapping into some other level of intuition or unconscious insight. Uh, and that's how we get to the Diane Seller name and, and link that to Mulholland or what happened on Mulholland Drive. Um, so there's that dimension. But um, there are strange things happening with time throughout the film because, of course, the film starts with this prelude, if you like, which is the jitterbug dance sequence the strange uh, superimposition of this um, very um, saturated images of a young woman, uh, turns out to be Betty, um, with these um, older grandparent figures that mm -hmm. we see she meets on the plane and then drive off in the limo, the black limo, in this very unnerving, historical laughter kind of uh, mm -hmm. scene, who then, of course, appear in the final psychotic breakdown, suicide or whatever, uh, you want to call that scene at the very conclusion of the film. Um, so these things are kind of uh, interrupting that linear flow, that kind of cause and effect logic. And that's what's so disorienting, even in the first part. Yes. Yeah. Right? That, that we're getting sort of dream-like flashes of intuition, insights that, that are mm. uh, uh, serving as clues to mm. uh, you know, follow the mystery further. And we're also... Um, you know, experiencing these um, strange interruptions mm. of the, the sort of flow of, of time in, in the film. Mm. And then, of course, when one gets to this, you know, um, transitional and uh, really crucial moments where, let's say, the trauma becomes too close, too apparent, right? Mm. I'm thinking, obviously, about those scenes where, you know, the, the Club Silencio sequence um here, I mean, here as well, we're, we're, we're no longer in some kind of um, linear sort of time-space yeah. set of coordinates. Right? Um, and it's very interesting if you sort of track the way the film style works over that first part, up, up to, let's say, the Club Silencio sequence. Um, it, it's like an undoing of that movement image, causal narrative logic, psychological logic, driving the narrative. It's an undoing of that. It's like an unraveling of of the, the, the style and also the structure um to the point where you know you you literally have um rita in a trance speaking in spanish no hay banda mm -hmm. uh club silencio and and by the way i mean that to me was such a fascinating sequence not only be, because i mean it's visually and um orally quite stunning but it, it taps into what i've always thought of as this sort of dual nature of, of the film and it's Set in Los Angeles, Hollywood, City of Dreams, you know, the dream factory of Hollywood. But it's also got this interesting um, kind of underside, which is suppressed, which is Los Angeles and the sort of whole Hispanic dimension. So it was really significant that um, Laura Elena Amorin, who ran his half Spanish as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, taps into this in that dream and then gets this call it message or intuition what have you called silencio that's where we have to go and gets a message so so this thing in lynch's films of receiving information intuition insights through either dreamlike means or through art and in particular music and voice so even in razorhead right the radio lady or dorothy valens in blue velvet or you know uh rebecca del rio mm. in uh um Mulholland drive um little and twin peaks right mm -hmm. you, you have these moments of that sort of logical or psychologically kind of familiar causally linked narrative flow mm -hmm. interrupted by these um aesthetically charged and quite overwhelming moments involving usually music and or song and singing particularly female vocalists um and and that's very striking in um in Malhondra. It would be wonderful to do a study of the use of female vocalists and song as a means of not just artistic expression, but kind of tapping into you know, unconscious insights and so on, trauma in this case, mm -hmm. um, in Lynch's films. It's certainly very important in, in Mulholland Drive. And that whole sequence, which which we could talk about, I guess, at, at length, is, is really the, the, the sort of key. Um, 
which mm -hmm. talks somewhere in an interview about the eye of the duck scene. It's this yeah. mm -hmm. really important scene in the film that kind of draws together all these elements. But it's not a narrative climax. It's just kind of pre like, like a constellational effect, draws elements together in a really um, profoundly sort of rich and suggestive way. So that's the Club Silencio scene in, in Mulholland Drive. So, so yeah, even though there are these kind of quite linear sequences, they, they do get interrupted. And, and we, by the end of that whole part of the film, we're now in this dream place, <laughs> as, as Betty says at one point. And that whole daytime logic of, you know, linear causality, so it's completely unraveled. And we're now in this this in between space, and I think mm. for me that's one of the really challenging features of the film. I mean, I know you know just before we were sort of touching on this dreams versus reality kind of structure, and I think you know in in broad terms that does help uh, help one navigate the film and make sense of mm. uh, in broad terms what's happening. But really, the film. Uh, where where it brings you is into this in between zone, mm. uh, this indeterminate zone, and that is part of the disorientation that that can be, I think, aesthetically thrilling and, I think, philosophically thought provoking, but also can be very discomforting. And I, I again can definitely see why, you know, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Mm. Um, you know, some film guys, film guys don't enjoy that experience, but if you do. Uh, being brought into this world, into this space, this liminal space, this in between, mm -hmm. indeterminate zone between, you know, reality, fantasy, dreaming, I mean, trauma and artistic expression. Um, you know, it, it, it's a love story at its core as well, mm -hmm. but a tragic one of love gone wrong, you know, in, in, in the most sort of dramatic and, and, and violent and awful fashion. Mm -hmm. um, but it's again this this in between zone that makes it very hard to 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 fully grasp uh, mm -hmm. what what it is we're seeing and 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 that to me is the, again the the real achievement of the film. Um, but yeah, I, I know that that's not always how um, uh, everyone sees it. Maybe it's a bit like um, the, the the red room in Twin Peaks, isn't it? It's this place where mm -hmm. time is suspended. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not in time anymore; you're above or below time, but. Yes. Uh, um, it doesn't affect you the same way that it does when you are either in the dream or in reality. Um, mm. it, it doesn't function according to the same laws of physics. Absolutely. And so the remarkable thing is, how do you uh, evoke that mood and atmosphere, uh, that effectively charged space and sense of time in a movie such that viewers can experience some of that state themselves and that that to me is the real thing um because it's not just something you um intellectually impose on the film say like, ah now now i get it it's really you know interrupting linear time causality uh etc etc it's it's something that has to be felt and experienced and i think this is where you know even though lynch is notoriously um you know elusive and um you know cryptic and unwilling to you know, answer interviewers' questions. So, Mr. Lynch, what does the film really mean? Oh, well, you know, it's a love story, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. Um, even though he he's notorious for those sorts of very cryptic and um, often uninformative answers, at the same time, um, you know, he does really stress the importance of intuition, feeling, um, of being able to apprehend states of experience that are um, in many ways, ineffable or very difficult to verbalize and to articulate, that that are temporally, if you like, non-linear, um, and that art, film, can evoke and express and allow us to experience these states through, well, you know, if, if you've looked at some of David Lynch's interviews, he actually says quite a bit on this, uh, on this matter. He talks about ideas. Uh, and he talks about cinema, like all art, is about capturing ideas, ideas that essentially have an unconscious source. And, you know, as you know, he's very into transcendental meditation and has, you know, has written about this extraordinarily rich knowledge from what I gather about a huge number of, um, and, and quite interesting kind of, kind of take on Eastern uh, philosophies and transcendental meditation. So, and he definitely has this sort of sense of ideas that are the source of, art artistic uh, creation are um 
these entities that we tap into via unconscious sources and means, but the whole task of the artist, of the filmmaker, is to um, tune into those ideas and be able to articulate them, you know, in this case, through the cinematic medium. You know, and that involves sound, music, you know, color, framing, shot selection, you, you name it, all of the, the arts of, of cinema. And, and of course, Lynch is not just a director, he's a soundscaper, a musician, makes furniture, I mean, you name it, right? Sort of um, uh, a master of all these um, different arts in cinema. So, yeah, that's that's the really fascinating thing about um, uh, a film like Mulholland Drive, that it, it, it situates you in that in-between inter indeterminate zone. And so, of course, it raises that question, well, how does the film do that? You know, and, and I think there's um, a lot happening with the dissociative nature of image and 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 sound um that that evokes or creates this sense of disorientation that that allows one to experience something of this indeterminate state between let's say waking and dreaming or fantasy and reality or or you know the unconscious and the conscious self or or plane of experience and does so in this incredibly rich an evocative way as part of this this kind of mystery narrative so that that to me is really one of the remarkable things about the film mm -hmm. that reminds me of some of the writing that's come out recently about ideas related to perception and integrating certain indigenous ideas that might have been dismissed before one that might be described as instead of saying if or saying and and that we don't have yeah. to binary between illusion and reality but that there are states yeah. that are very real for the viewer or the participant yes. for example yeah oh ab absolutely and and i think you know this <clears throat> this fascinating i mean it's, it's always very tempting to sort of lay a theory on the film say ah now, now i've got it it's it's ideas so that must mean it's plato or it's kant or it's schopenhauer right and it's probably a mishmash of those things but it's also quite idiosyncratic and quite distinctive. And I do think it resonates with, you know, uh, different cultural traditions. I mean, you know, as we mentioned, I mean, Lynch does have a serious interest in um, Eastern thought. Um, and, you know, I think this kind of works its way into his his worldview, but also his his cinema. And, um, you know, this, this idea that um, a very dualistic, rationalistic representational frame that's directed towards control and mastery of nature and the world is disastrous has has led us to the brink of well it's, you know catastrophe even extinction um i mean if you look at all of linter's films i mean people do um note the uh you know the role of violence or of, of evil forces and so on um in his films i mean i, I for a long time been quite fascinated by this because it's um it's very common of course to find violence and evil characters in films right there's you know, psycho killers and serial killers and you know and so on um and a lot of films do deal with nihilism and and the kind of question of meaning in uh you know god forsaken or secular slash post-secular world and then certainly i think is in this kind of tradition um but at the same time, there is this um, sense that that the violence and the the scale of the narratives that, that we experience do hint at darker, much broader forces. And and there is something about. I mean, this film is, I think, more squarely focused on Hollywood and cinema. Um, but there's there's definitely a sense of sort of malevolent and violent and even sort of traumatizing underside to Hollywood, mm. um, and you know, more generally, let's say, to, um, you know, the making of, of, of movies mm. that we we need to to focus on, we need to acknowledge in some way. Um, you know, it, it is, uh, I mean, there, there, there is the dedication of the film to Jennifer Seam or Syme, I think it was, mm. um, who uh, died, I think it was in a car accident in, in 2001. She was a, an extra in Lost Highway, I think, and, and various other films. Um, you know, and 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 this sort of story of the um, small time actors trying to make it big and being spat out by the system and crushed, you know. There, there's also hints. I mean, 
pro pre um me too you know hollywood um harassment i mean there's hints of that all over the place mm. in the films too, that you know this is this is this is the reality behind the dream factory that certainly a lot of young women and um, young uh, female actresses uh, experience so there's a lot of that um you know dark side of hollywood being explored in the films at the same time at the same time as you know and almost this sort of you know um i tend to say kind of yin yang kind of way as this extraordinary um focus on the power of performance the mm. power of cinema, the magic of cinema mm. you know so to me i i can think of a few other films that that um display what we mean when we talk about the magic of cinema right and i'm thinking of like the fantastic scene where betty does her audition mm. Mm uh and you know we we've we this is a big deal in terms of the plot she's come to hollywood she's gonna make it she wants to be a star you know it's the sort of rags to riches story she's got a big audition she's running around very excited they do a rehearsal and the rehearsal is, is very interesting because the um reader character is very wooden the way she speaks the lines is sort of um, obviously clumsy and you know amateurish and Betty's, you know, pretty professional sounding, right? Mm -hmm. But okay, she's rehearsing for the uh, audition, turns up to the audition, and there's this hilarious cast of characters. It's quite interesting, I think, that scene when you watch it, because there are some um, quite comical characters, like the director, um, um, Bob Brooker, I think he's called, um, who makes the most bizarre mm -hmm. sort of directorial <laughs> comments. <laughs> um, humanistic <laughs> yeah, but not really a, you know it just makes no sense and um so it's quite funny when one knows a little bit about lynch's directorial kind of comments it's kind of funny to see um, bob brooker saying these sorts of things and um yeah the woody cats character with this sort of impossibly orange suntan mm. raggy face kind of old-time hollywood actor so there's this sort of old hollywood school like wall right who's very generously brought um, Betty into this uh, rehearsal. And then you got the kind of contemporary um, kind of characters. Uh, I forget the name of the, you know, sort of top casting agent in Hollywood is there with a kind of cool assistant. Yeah. And they're checking it out. And they're the ones who whisk Betty out afterwards, say, oh, I've got a director you've got to meet. He's he's the real deal. No, Wall's never going to make this film, Sylvia. No, it's never going to happen. But in that scene, in that sequence, um, George Tolles has written a wonderful analysis of um, Betty's audition scene in Mulholland Drive, just breaking down this. And this is a masterclass of what we mean by the magic of performance in cinema. It's, it's absolutely stunning. And in context, all we've seen of Betty, uh, now what's quite brilliantly just plays her as this perky ingenue, a bit Doris Day, a bit, mm. a bit um, you know, sort of, up, up for mystery and adventure kind of thing, but naive and, and so on. And she transforms mm -hmm. in this scene uh, and turns what, you know, by her own, again, it's a pretty lame script, into this absolutely just jaw-dropping moment of sexual tension, transgression. And so much of it does prefigure the, yeah, transgressive nature of the relationships she's having and also this sort of, you know, I'll kill you, you'll go to jail, and so on. That's prefiguring a lot of things. But just the nature of the performance, the intensity of it is just stunning. And and in context, you really get this sense of, even though we're, we're being shown a lot of the dark side of Hollywood, and sort of traumatic underbelly and underside of Hollywood, at the same time, there is this recognition of this extraordinary power, this, this force of greater transformation that, that cinema can capture and evoke. And uh, and I think you really see that in in that wonderful audition thing. And and this, but at the same time, this audition is also uh, showing us a metamorphosis into someone else, which is very yes, much about yes. the heart of individuality that is at the heart of the film. So yes. what is beautiful is also what is potentially dangerous. Yes, absolutely. And the two are twinned mm. in in Lynch's work so much. Uh, you know, beauty is about the beginning of terror in many of Lynch's scenes. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And um, and that idea of um, transfiguration of, of uh, one's character into someone else is is 
you know, again, taken to even further extremes, perhaps in Inland Empire, but is certainly there in uh, in Mulholland Drive, and you know, really does. Yeah, th th this is where the whole mystery, the whole discussion around the mystery of the identity of, of Rita, and so to speak, the mystery itself of what we make of Betty in relation to Diane or Rita in relation to Camilla. I mean, so much of that is is in some respects encapsulated by what you've just um, pointed to, which is this idea of uh, transfiguration of oneself into another, into another character. And so in a way, um, the exploration of identity using the, the idea of the act of the performance and, and the transfiguration of that via cinema, that there's something else that happens uh, in the capturing of and you know projecting of uh, or screening of a human figure performing, acting, and becoming someone or something else um, you know, Stanley Cavell notes this as one of the um, very distinctive features of, of, of cinema as a medium. And I think that's true. You know, there is something uh, which we all find deeply fascinating in um, what happens on screen, why some actors are able to evoke an atmosphere, a mood, a sensibility that is so distinctive, so rich, so powerful, but also protein and malleable, can be transformed into different characters. And how that happens, and and yet we retain this strong sense of the identity of the actor or actress uh, throughout their their metamorphoses into you know uh, however many characters they 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 may portray in their careers. So again, there is that that sort of magical, um, almost a metaphysical quality to to cinema and cinematic performance, which I think that the film beautifully explores in in some of those sequences. Yeah. Gosh, I, I can't help but think of Kenneth Anger in the discussion that we've just had for two reasons. Um, first, mm -hmm. because when we were speaking about this dark side of cinema, mm -hmm. um, when we were just re-watching Mulholland Drive the other day, I thought this is almost a visual representation or a case study from his book, Hollywood Babylon, where he really explores right. this underbelly of Hollywood. Yes. And then at the same time, of course, he's someone who's very interested in magic and cinema and transformation. Yes, and we've got yes, kind of two yes. sides of the puzzle present there. And I know, of course, we're not the first to draw comparisons with Anger's work yes. in relationship to, to Lynch. And I think they manifest in subtly different mm. ways. At the same time, it's really interesting that we do have those two sides there, this very powerful potential of cinema and at the same time mm -hmm. it's really potential uh side for very dark malice uh underneath yeah, well that's right and and in the middle is the um comic but also sinister world of money of studios of the mafia <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. so you know it's almost like this threefold kind of structure in a way um and it's it's bringing those elements together in in this extraordinary manner i mean you know of course, we, we we have to think of um, films like, you know, um, Sunset Boulevard or Bad and Beautiful, um, you know, Eight and a Half and, and, and so on. There's, there's you know, such a rich tradition of, of metacinematic kind of movies, movies about movies. And so often you, you, you have those elements, you know, there's this sort of conflict between, you know, commercial success and artistic authenticity. There's a sort of corrupt and vain quality of these studio slash production sort of apparatus. Um, there's the whole sort of sexual, sexual exploitation side as well that's just written into, baked into the whole institutional practice as, 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 we, as we know. Uh, but that that figures prominently in, in all of those films. Um, but Lynch just adds this other dimension, which is again hard to describe, but something like the sort of you know, metaphysical dimension. You know, when we um, get to the latter part of the film and the the denouement, such as it is, so the the suicide of the Diane Selwyn character, and then this sort of strange coda, this. Uh, sequence of images of the um, the bum behind Winkies again mm. returns, which if Diane had suicided shouldn't really happen because this is part of the earlier mm. sort of sequence that we see the Winkies dream uh, sequence with the the young um, um, 
the young man, I think, I can't remember his name, Ben, I think it was in the script oh, or something. <laughs> Mr. Todd. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, which is, which is itself um, fascinating. Um, but, you know, this recurs at the end of the film. There's the blue box in the paper bag. It falls out, rhyming with the falling of the blue box earlier when um, uh, Rita actually, Bond Rita, puts the wonderfully triangulate blue key into the box and falls around. And then we get this sort of portal moment into another dimension, let's say, or another world or a corresponding world. Um, so all of this is happening, and this now doesn't fit into, oh, it's a film about Hollywood. Right? This is going off into some other dimension of meaning, of metaphysics, of mind, of unconsciousness. You, know, you can say, but it's certainly no longer within the frame of the more conventional, you know, Hollywood metacinematic film about Hollywood, right? Um, even though that that is in in many ways what what sort of anchors and 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 gives um, substance to to my Holden Drive um, overall. So that that's an element that Lynch brings to it. And again, I think it goes even further uh, in that direction in something like Inland Empire. I think I think it takes us to the Hollywood not so much as the place itself, but as the 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 star factory. Uh, that is the yes. place where the collective dream is created, but a collective dream that in the process is going to crush so many individual dreams. Yes, uh, yes. And, um, and, and I was thinking about the, the magic of cinema. I mean, uh, to someone who's never seen a film, I mean, it could be akin to magic, this idea that you can resuscitate uh, people or scenes from the past and, uh, and screen them uh, for everyone Absolutely, to... Absolutely, yes. And um, I was thinking about the, the, the many moments in the in the film that are reminiscent of fairy tales i think there is something about a fairy tale a dark yes. fairy tale there too with magic with the fact that uh, adam um the, the film director lives on a castle at the top um and he's uh going to marry the princess uh um who That's is right. yes. what she wanted to be so I, I think that fairy tales are also omnipresent in this world of dreams of dark well nightmares really i mean when dreams yes. are power right absolutely and uh, you you mentioned um I mean, this link between magic and the cinema and the the technology of, of cinema and that's that is something that i think lynch is deeply fascinated by uh not only electricity I and mean, we could have a whole discussion about the meaning of electricity in lynch you know <laughs> in twin little and twin peaks uh, the return but the the conjunction of um, technologies, technologies of recording and technologies of capturing and, and reproducing, you know, experience um, that are uh, electrical and today digital technologies that both capture and transfigure or transform or allow our experience to be manipulated as well at the same time. It's deeply fascinating for, for Lynch. And there's so many... Uh, explorations in his work of the use of technologies recording technology from the, the phonograph, I mean, the camera, the cinematograph, the phonograph, the tape recording, <laughs> uh, Banda, um, the idea that recording experience, um, the movie camera, the video camera, the lost highway, uh, and so on. So it's this conjunction between technology that, on the one hand, you know, is this um, paradigmatic signifier of modernity, of, you know, secular rationalism, of applied science, technology, making our lives better, progress, et cetera, et cetera. That's at the same time linked with, uh, through art, through the art of uh, moving uh, pictures, with this evocation of, 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 of magic, of, of tapping into the unconscious, of, of transfiguring our experience and uh, allowing us to experience other worlds, mm. both literally and, and uh, as well as, as figuratively, other worlds mm. and other dimensions of the world that, that we're not uh, ordinarily apprised of. And it's technology that allows us, gives us that portal into these other worlds. And you can see that again very, uh, very explicitly in, in that empire, but it's certainly all, already. Um, you know, present in, in Mulholland Drive. Um, and at the same time, you know, the, although there is this dark side to, to those technologies, they do allow us to dream, to transfigure our experience or reinvent worlds, you know, and 
it's really interesting that in the Khan um, interview with, with Lynch, one of the things he does say, which I think is, is, is very illuminating, is the idea of cinema being a world. Mm. So we, we, we enter into, we literally enter into a world uh, when we watch a movie, you know, and, and a lot of theorists, film theorists, film philosophers have really become interested, I think, in this idea of films as well. So instead of thinking of them as a narrative, you know, film narrative, and then, you know, interpreting the narrative, understanding the diegesis and, you know, all questions of production or stylistic techniques, thinking about cinema as a world, uh, you know, and, and especially a, a rich and evocative and, and mysterious world, such as we find in uh, Mulholland Drive, uh, gives another angle, another perspective, another portal into understanding mm -hmm. uh, the art of cinema, you know, to think about it as a world. And that, that's certainly how, how I, you know, understand um, Mulholland Drive, if you like, is, is as a world. Um, and of course, one can never fully get the measure of a world. <laughs> that's the whole point. There's always background dimensions to a world um, which are the precondition of uh, having a perspective and being able to engage with it, make sense of our being in the world, if you like, um, you know, in practical terms, but we can never fully get uh, a God's eye view of a world. And that, that's, I think, just sine qua non for, for Lynch, that that's, we always have a partial perspective and experience on our worlds, and certainly the worlds of cinema that, that he uh, invites us into uh, give us a very rich sense of how partial our perspectives can be. You know, and yet at the same time, we have an intuition of there being something more, something greater, uh, a whole that somehow encompasses us. Yeah, exactly. We were going to ask what you think about this notion of an entire filmography as a world, especially in the case of Lynch, um, because we were speaking about, in addition to the production background mm -hmm. of Mulholland Drive and the fact that it may have initially been imagined as a spin-off of Twin Peaks, yeah. and it certainly came about at the mm -hmm. same time as Twin Peaks, so one might... Uh, extrapolate. Mm. There was a lot. There were a lot of references to Twin Peaks in mind during the creation of Mulholland Drive, and then we see the presence of the characters Laura Palmer and Ronette Pulaski uh, in the Silencio Theater. I know. I'm just wondering what you think about this idea yeah. of filmography as a world <laughs> and distinguish oh. visual titles. I'm, I'm really glad you raised that. Pardon me. Um, this uh, wonderful bit of information about about Club Silencio and the fact that there are, you know, such uh, hugely important, significant figures as Laura Palmer and and, um, and Pulaski in that space is, is extraordinary. I, of course, like most viewers, you know, we, we're talking about, when was the film released? 2001. I mean, um, and, until we got the, the DVD and then if you were to do freeze frame, then you could have a look, of course, to the naked eye, so to speak, for the, um, you know, uh, cinema goer in the wild actually watching the film as it was unfolding you 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 simply wouldn't wouldn't kind of crest perhaps you could intuit some of that and i know you've been very interested in the use of superimposition in lynch's work which i think is actually a really fascinating area the, the other area that links with that is of course the soundscaping and the use of various you know subsonic and other times i mean lynch has just got an amazing relationship not only with badlamenti as a composer you know the late Angelo Badlamenti, but also with just the art of soundscaping, which again has become a huge topic of interest in people interested in theorizing cinematic worlds, right? Because these are audio visual worlds, not necessarily visual audio worlds. So the sound is incredibly important. But <clears throat> the idea of uh, a world being linked as worlds are in a, in, a, in a constellation, a universe, is of course super fascinating and, you know, Certainly, when you think of uh, Twin Peaks: The Return, which I, I know you and, and Frank are um, consummate, um, you know, connoisseurs of uh, that world, um, it's hard not to think of a universe, a kind of constellation of worlds where there are there are these non-local, lo lo localizable links between different dimensions of these worlds, and so the idea there could be some strange topological resonance or connection between, let's say, the um, the worlds of Blue Velvet, Mulholland Drive, and an Empire, uh, Twin Peaks, Return, Papers, even going uh, the other direction, you know, Lost Highway and, 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 and the Razorhead and so on. I mean, it makes a lot of sense in, in a way because there are these, I mean, and I, I find that a more satisfying or, or in, in enlightening way of thinking about uh, a filmmaker's body of work than the more traditional sort of auteurist 
kind of um, approaches, you know. And again, I mean, all of those um, theories, as you know, were, were in large part still part of that that old debate, which goes right back to the very, very early days of cinema. Is cinema an art? <laughs> or is it just a clever technological gimmick, you know, canned theatre kind of thing? Um, which, you know, has kind of returned in an odd way uh, when the digital revolution began, you know, and all those old questions were suddenly new. You know, what is the ontology of the digital image? What's the, uh, you know, what aesthetic features? Is there a distinctive medium or is it just film, you know, by by other means uh, that we're dealing with now? Um, so all those questions have, have become new again. Um, but this idea that you think about uh film worlds communicating with each other and having resonances and sort of exchanges or or connections with each other i i find that that really fascinating and it does it does add another dimension to, to one's uh experience of these films because as i mentioned before the 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 striking thing for me about that film is how it operates at these levels mm. not only call it the sort of more overt such as it is narrative level of you know the story of betty and reader and um Diane and Camilla, and, and what happens, but also at a cinematic level with the history of cinema and so on. But then one should include with, within that uh, account some relationships that are clearly being um, worked through uh, with regard to Lynch's other films. You know, and I mentioned before just the the motif, let's say, of the the, the female performer, the singer, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is is, is really important in, in Lynch's work. Really fascinating. Um, so one can think about connections um, at that level, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and there are a host of others, um, the, the cars, <laughs> use of cars mm -hmm. in, in his films, um, chases, um, doppelgangers, uh, doublings, <laughs> you know, the, the, the list goes on. Um, but yes, thinking about resonances between worlds and how these worlds intercommunicate and, and in a way that's that's sort of, quasi independent of of lynch as auteur i think that's that's important too because you know i think the traditional way of thinking about is, oh we have these uh, amazing auteur artist uh, filmmakers directors like lynch say with his signature motifs and his body of work and development and so on and you know hermeneutically i mean it still makes sense like when i teach uh film to students you know it's even though you you say well of course this is an outdated way of thinking about film but then we talk about a Hitchcock film, or oh, this is late Hitchcock compared with, and, and so on. So we, it's hard not to use some of that vocabulary and some of that way of thinking, but it's not enough. And, and certainly uh, for thinking about Lynch's work, yeah, the idea of intercommunication between worlds and the idea that there's a kind of a Lynchian universe. I mean, with Twin Peaks and Return, as, as, as you um, showed, I think, quite uh, magnificently in your book, Frank, there are so many levels mm. of, you know, intertextual um, resonance and illusion and, and um, connection uh, occurring in, in uh, Twin Peaks, um, as well as, you know, references to other Lynch works, uh, that it's, 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 it's quite mind boggling, you know. But, but I think that's kind of consistent with, with the way Lynch talks about film and these ideas, that they, that they connect, that they resonate. So if the ideas are not conceptual, in, in the way that philosophers might think about it, think, oh, well, you mean concepts, mm -hmm. concepts some notion uh, of an intellectual kind, a representation intellectual um, idea. And these are um, affective aesthetic ideas that are sensuously perceived, you know, which a number of philosophers have talked about. You know, you think of um, Schopenhauer, Meloponti, and, and, and others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but they communicate, they have relationships. In the same way that concepts or conceptual ideas have relationships, so too do, let's say, cinematic or audiovisual ideas have relationships. So it would make sense to think that these ideas and combinations of them recur in, in various forms uh, across different films and communicate with each other across different Lynch films. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I would argue that uh, his worlds are, um, are, are very much like clouds, uh, I've got the feeling that they are a bit fluctuating and moving in space and that there's a certain yes. undecidability as to their mm. borders. 
uh, as to is it Lynch or is it uh, Hitchcock through Lynch or I mean there's a blending of all of this that is continuously mm. taking place and this made me think about what you said concerning the point of view and the perspective that one has in his films that uh, the camera mm. is basically cutting a slice of the world and showing us this portion of the world, but not what's outside, and linking this to the use of sound, which is much more world yes. because it is um, all around you, and uh, it evokes things that you don't see, that you can't quite name, um, like um, acousmatic music, in a sense, you know, this idea that... Yes elements you can't exactly understand what they are but they are there and they're going to influence you nonetheless absolutely yes and combining the 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 sound and the music and the you know the soundscaping with, with the uh, the visual dimensions to to create a sense of world is is just so important and certainly lynch is a, is a master of that i mean i think of that amazing scene in in blue velvet like early on um where um jeffrey's father has the heart attack kind of watering the lawn, peels over, has a heart attack, dog's there nipping at the jet of water coming out from the uh, hose. It was a very weird phallic moment. And, um, you know, the, 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 the sound in that sequence is so terrifying, right, that it just, it just heightens the sort of, mm. I mean, what happens in literal terms is, 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 is sad, but it's not this deep, dark, traumatic event. And then later when um, uh, Jeffrey... Uh, stumbles across the ear, you know, the, the famous scene of the camera. And, and th this is something, again, really um, interesting in Lynch's work. I mean, we can talk about the um, the way uh, the camera or the, let's say, cinematic perspective um, varies and how it's deployed in, in certain scenes. It's, it's very distinctive and sometimes very unusual. So in the Blue Velvet scene where we go in, into the ear uh, as as it were, and, and this idea of portals, so the camera going into a portal into an ear, or in the case of um, Blue Velvet, literally into the black box, the Pandora's box, uh, the, the heart or kernel of the trauma, um, and then entering another dimension or another world, that comes up again and again, you know, and in the Blue Velvet scene, it's this fascinating use of sound where we keep going further, further into the lawn, into the dirt, the earth, the worms, the bugs, and that squelching sound is just kind of visceral and kind of disgusting and fascinating at the same time. And, and that's how you generate this sense of immersive, affective, bodily involvement. I've, I've become very interested um, recently, stuff I've been looking at, um, drawing on German um, neo-phenomenology about atmospheres and the idea that, um, you know, we, we can talk about feelings, motions, even affects, but we, we also need to talk about atmosphere as this sort of quasi, uh, neither subjective nor objective in a straightforward sense, but occupying this this, this in-between zone or space as, as, a, as a felt space. So mm -hmm. Lynch himself talks about this, you know, the atmosphere when you enter a room, like film can express that. So it's not just a subjective feeling, it's not just something objective about the space. It's this lived bodily experience of the attuned nature of the space, the attunement of the space, the stimmung, if you want, of the space. That you can recognize, you can feel it, you can sense it. Uh, it may be difficult to pin down and describe, but the experience itself is very concrete and palpable, even though our language for it is fairly ambiguous and a bit rough. Um, but that's where cinema comes into its own. And I think that's why Lynch insists on, you know, the, the, the language of cinema is, is very distinctive and expressive. Um, cinema can use abstractions, ideas, and communicate feelings, emotions, states of mind, moods, atmospheres that we find otherwise very hard to verbally articulate. Now, I think that's being 100% sincere. It's not just, you know, trying to obfuscate or, or impress uh, interviewers. Uh, it's it's generally part of the, the process and, and the, the kind of art of cinema as, as he sees it and practices it. Uh, so that, that idea that we're entering worlds that have this atmospheric quality. I mean, one of the things that um, moved me about uh, Mulholland Drive that I wanted to write about was, was the use of mood and the, the role of mood um, and how 
you know, in, in some sequences, mood becomes all encompassing, all enveloping. It, it, it kind of saturates the whole space, the whole, you know, meaning of what we're experiencing in, in a sense. And Club Silencio, right? That, that whole sequence, for example, is just extraordinary in, in those terms. Um, and, and that's what, you know, a film like Mahal Drive can really make one experience that this, you know, mood is normally something just in the background that orients us in the world you know we, we're never without mood and moodedness uh as a way of orienting ourselves practically but also you know cognitively in terms of doing and, and thinking but we're not normally that conscious of it unless something's going wrong like we're feeling depressed or down or you know or hyped up or what have you but what lynch's films can do is is turn that around so that the mood becomes all enveloping and even overwhelming mm. and and i think you really experience that in in, in some of the um, sequences in in mahal and drive and so it becomes hard to really pin down what you know, people say it's dreamlike or it's nightmarish or it's surreal and it's all of those things but that's more a, a, a grasping you know for language that will help us articulate that experience of, of, of very distinctive but, but quite ambiguous hard to describe moods and he is really uh, one of the most remarkable filmmakers for evoking mood, I, I would say, and, and certainly uh, in uh, Mulholland Drive. Um, it, it's not a question, but um, talking about mood and atmosphere, this makes me think that it would be very interesting to do a meteorological study of the films of mm. Lynch. I think there's really something of a yes. red in the environment and what's happening in the in the people and um i mean and yes. but, um, also of, of course from the point of view of the sound it's almost like sometimes as when there is a storm coming you can see the pressure of the air getting stronger yes. it's going mm. to change the way you feel and your emotions absolutely i mean lynch talked about um you know arriving in los angeles in this light you know this sort of west coast light. and linking the light with los angeles and the landscape and the feel the mood the sort of sense of possibilities and so on and you know that that comes across you know benny arriving in la is this, this dazzling mm. kind of experience the light is just magic and everything glows everything is is just cranked up a bit more bright and vivid than ordinary reality generally is and that's so in keeping with the mood the, the you know the, the kind of or vibe that uh, those scenes evoke and that the character, the, the world that, that they are both expressing and, um, you know, inhabiting in, in, in the case of Betty as this aspiring young, young actress you know, wanting to make her dreams come true. Um, and, you know, so much of that, again, is linked to the sounds, linked to the, to the music. I mean, Lynch's ability to use music. I mean, I'm very interested, for example, in, I mean, this, obviously the the fascination with the 50s and tapping into some darker um tone in what you know stereotypically is described as the very sort of naive or wholesome kind of you know uh, white picket fence image of the 50s and as we know lynch is the master sort of subverting that and showing that there was actually this darker tone and you think of roy orbison's music roy orbison's songs which at one level, I just just you know beautifully crafted, beautifully written, beautifully performed songs, but always carry this dark mm. pathos, this note of melancholy or of despair, of loss. Mm. You know, much of his work is yeah, not only in his personal life, but in his um, uh, musical compositions, um, dealing with with pain and 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 loss. And so Lynch is able to sort of tap into those qualities of mood in those songs and then turn them inside out and then detourn them or, or kind of transform them in in new context so you know um the the extraordinary um, um in dreams uh i walk with you sequence in in um uh, blue velvet um but also the the use of the 50s music in um the Soviet north story the film within the film that's being filmed um and then, you know, various other sort of scorings of fantastic pieces of music for, you know, um, let's say when Adam Kesher comes back to his uh, Hollywood home and discovers his wife in bed with Billy Ray Cyrus, which is very comic and kind of 
but but shocking too, right? It's, it gets pretty pretty nasty, pretty violent. Um, but the, the use of music in in those sequences. So there's a sort of comic and ironic effect, but but there's also this yeah, there's always this kind of ability to tap into other moods that that aren't so much on the surface, but that the music can bring out. And that, of course, I mean the the absolute piece de resistance there is Rebecca Del Rio singing the Spanish version of Roy Orbison's Crying, mm-hmm. um, Yorando, and doing doing it in a way which just, you know, uh, I, I, I can't imagine uh, a film girl watching that not being moved to tears or moved profoundly, um, not only by the performance, but then what it signifies in context of that scene for mm-hmm. um, Betty and, and Rita. So, yeah, just an absolutely stunning um, fusion of elements of, of the music, of the soundscaping, of the mise en scene, the lighting, the color. Uh, you know, it's just it's incredible. I have the feeling that we could do a whole series of podcasts on Mulholland Drive with you. But it seems like it might be yeah. a good place to end for today. But we usually like to conclude with one final question, which is, mm-hmm. is there something you wish that we had asked that we didn't? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, look. Uh, something like, you know, some people say, yep, you can work out this film if you are, you know, focused, diligent, carefully, uh, you know, analyzing all the different parts of the film, you know, and 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 you can get to the bottom of it. Lynch himself is you kind know, of there is a story there you can you can piece it together. And then another school of thought said, no, that's totally the wrong way to to experience behind. You just go with the flow. It's this oniric kind of dream cinema vision, this experimental avant-garde work. You just go with it. Don't interpret, don't make sense, stop making sense. That's mm-hmm. not what it's about. So um, you know, maybe I can throw it to you. What do you think? (laughs) Because, yeah, I'm somewhere um, in between, um, you know, and and a bit undecided. Yeah, uh, I'm like you, I guess. I I like both approaches. Uh, And I think that, once again, it's not a question of either or, it's a question of and, and. I think that uh, they can function together, that you can both um, take pleasure in the ineffable in the film while at the same time trying to make sense of some of its elements. Um, Yes, I mean, um, reason is not necessarily opposed to emotions and that they can coexist and uh, function uh, simultaneously. Well, in my own writing, I write a lot about abstract experimental films. So I guess I'm much more of an open work kind of girl. Um, I don't really feel that I need a narrative thread to follow. Um, but I think what's interesting is that there is some loose, maybe we could mm. say um, this, but also that. I'm a big fan of Susan Sontag's yes. thread, this, but also that. And I think there are many different threads that one can pick up that are really interesting and that do have some narrative structure in the film. And yet it's loosely woven enough to leave that space that I really mm. relish in um, uh, Room to Dream. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I would definitely agree. And we should we should certainly follow that up that thought uh, further with um, yeah, some more discussions. That would be great. It would be a great be, pleasure. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Robert, for having uh, accompanied us tonight and uh, being uh, our guest on uh, After Images. It was a great, a great pleasure to hear your thoughts about Modern Drive. Yes, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And yes, it was a real pleasure for me too. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. And the best way to end this podcast is probably to say, silencio. Thank you for listening to After Images. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow After Images podcast on social media.